Um, as I said, uh, this is going to be largely discussion based um, with some context provided my, by myself. So feel free to unmute yourselves uh, when you wanna jump in to raise your hand, to drop a question in the chat. However, uh, however makes you feel comfortable to participate um, because oh, participation is the key to so, so um, today in our inaugural session, uh, I asked you all to read the first two chapters of the book of Hebrews. Um, anybody just off the bat, uh, does anybody have just sort of initial insights in like one or two sentences sort of what, what hit you, what struck you, what did something stand out as weird? Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Ellen. I, I have a question, which I think is fundamental enough that if you don't mind, I, I would start off by asking it. Sure. Um, we know about uh, some things about angels from the Bible. Like we know that they're messengers from God and that they form a kind of an army for God. Um, and that they're hierarchical, they're like ranks of them and stuff. But I don't really know very much about what kind of a thing angels are. Mm. I don't know where they came from. I don't know if they were created, if they were always here. I don't know what they're made of. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us anything about what kind of a thing angels are. Sure. Um, for the sake of, you're right, it is a really fundamental question. Let's wait until we jump into chapter one. And as soon as chapter one, we start hitting all those quotes about angels, right? And the dichotomy that the author sets up angels versus Jesus, uh, we can start talking about characteristics and contrasting. Does that sound good? So it sounds fine to me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, let's see, on Anne Hallmark's uh, screen. Um, I, I was struck by how instructive the first couple of chapters are to bring everybody into the picture, yeah. as though they needed to be brought in. Uh, a little bit, I think, unlike Paul's letters. So I'll stop there. That's a great point. Um, so we're going to talk about authorship and how this differs from um, other uh texts which have been or are attributed to Paul. Um, and you're right, even though sometimes it is styled the letter to the Hebrews, in fact, the text is more of a polemic, right, than it is an actual letter. The really only, the only thing that really gives it a, an epistolary format or structure is just at the end comes the traditional grace and peace to you and, and sort of a, a benediction as, as the author closes out the text. Um, so there, yeah, right off the bat, there's much more of a, this is what I have to say. I'm saying it directly to you. It's, it's much more of a one-sided conversation. Um, any more insights? We'll do one more insight before we, uh, we jump in. Um, I, I just thought when I read it, um, the first two chapters, but I went actually further in that, this sounds to me more like a sermon than it does a letter. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. There's even in the phrasing, there's almost a liturgical or prosaic quality to it. Um, absolutely. All right. Um, what I'm going to do, uh, what I did for my own sake is... Um, but I have that little stand of yours. Are you, are you talking to Mike, Don? Yes, I should mute myself. I just got in. No worries, no worries. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you have comments or questions. As I said, this is going to be a, a dialogue. What I'm going to do in the chat is um, actually what I did for my notes is I put together a Google Doc and I, um, I put my intro notes and then I actually put the text um, and I put my notes in as comments. So if you feel uh, comfortable with using a Google Doc, this can be a resource to you. And I had the realization today, let's see. Does that work? Will someone try the link and tell me if that actually goes through? If you can see what's uh, what's going on. It's it says we need access. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, request access. Okay. Yeah. Um, You'll get an email letting you know if the file is shared with you. Let's see. Oh. All right, this is not a change to anyone with the link. There we go. Copy link. Uh, 
anyone with a link on the internet with this link can. Uh, there it goes. All right. Now, now it showed up, yeah. Other people are seeing it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. OK. If you want to access the Google Doc and you cannot access it right now on this link, let me know. I was successful in getting it. OK. All right. I will take that as a sign. Uh, everyone is in. Um, and I don't want to take up the entire screen with it as a screen share. I might sc uh, screen share a few things just um, throughout the course, but right now I figured it'd be best if we sort of maintained a face to face dialogue. So, just really quickly before we jump in, we'll, we want to talk about um, where this text is coming from. So, the first question that we have is who wrote, uh, who wrote the book of Hebrews? And Traditionally, I think most of us are fami familiar with, enough with the concept that uh, Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, that was sort of the tradition in the early church. Um, a lot of major uh, church fathers at least were remotely amenable to that idea. Um, someone as early as Clement of Rome, so we're talking early first century, uh, accepted that Paul wrote the text. But he suggested that the reason that the text sounds different than most of other Paul's writings is because Paul was writing to a Jewish audience in Hebrew and Luke translated it into Greek, giving it his own editorial voice. Um, Origen, uh, one of my personal favorite, uh, well, he was snubbed the title of father, but that, that'll be for a different day. Uh, Origen as quoted by Eusebius, says that um, he's happy enough to accept the tradition that Paul wrote Hebrews, um, but in he said, let me see if I can quote it. He says, but who wrote the epistle in truth, God only knows. Um, so there's, there's enough ambiguity even in the second and third century about it. It's interesting, there was a bit of a push and pull between the Eastern church and the Western church about the authenticity of the book of Hebrews. The Greek speaking church, the Eastern church was much uh, more willing to immediately adopt the text as Pauline and to begin to uh, mine it for spiritual uh, value. Uh, whereas the Latin church, the Western church centered in Rome was a bit more skeptical. And uh, occasionally it, it, it was never listed in like heretical texts or texts which were rejected. But when they would put it in the canon, they'd sort of stick it all the way back near Revelation so that it got less prominence um, than, than other Pauline epistles. It wasn't attached to the rest of the rest of the corpus there. Martin Luther did the same thing when he did his German translation of the Bible. He was unsure about its authenticity and its value. And so he separated it and put it with, I think, Jude, Revelation, and one other text. He sort of stuck it stuck it at the back. Um, but there's a lot of comfort throughout the history of the church with the idea that Paul wrote uh, Hebrews, even though unanimous scholar, sorry, excuse me, modern scholars are almost unanimous in their, uh, in their agreement that Paul did not write it. And they've floated a lot of other alternative authors such as Barnabas, Paul's traveling companion from the book of Acts, or Luke, uh, the person who is attributed as the author of Luke Acts, which we went through together. Um, another person that is coming into prominence as a possible author is Priscilla. And you'll remember that Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla, uh, Roman Christians who are wealthy tent makers, and they are of great help to Paul. And uh, sort of sacred tradition has it that Priscilla became a quite prominent Christian uh, in the larger Roman Christian community. Um, so, so, so some people like to float that as a concept. So in the end, um, there's, a, there's a large traditional foundation for the church viewing it as Pauline, even though it probably isn't. Now, the fact that there is some overlap with uh, sort of characteristics that make a letter authentically from the Apostle Paul, that could either come from simply the fact that Paul's uh, teaching and manner of speech and even manner of, of, of instructing Christians had sort of seeped enough into the water table that there was enough of a, an awareness about it that people were emulating it. Or that it was written by a disciple of Paul who wanted to give 
who was re-putting forward Paul's own beliefs and thoughts, but wanted to give it more credence, so titled it as a, or attributed it to Paul rather than simply sticking their own, own name on the letter. So um, ever since its beginning, there has been sort of a, a cloud around who wrote Paul, where is it coming from? The text of Hebrews uh, was written, um, well, so it's interesting. So by the, by the, by its name, right, we automatically get the, uh, we get the idea that the, the letter is written to Hebrews, to Jewish people, uh, uh, specifically Jewish Christians. And being a text written to Christians with a Jewish heritage or history, especially a Jewish cultural memory, even if they're not living in um, Israel or living near Jerusalem, it is noteworthy that a text which relies so heavily on um, sacrificial imagery, on mosaic law, on things that are very particular to Jewish custom, that the author does not mention the destruction of the temple in 70 AD by Titus. And so this leads most, most modern scholars to place the uh, the text, uh, the, the date of, of its writing around 63, 64 AD. So a few years before that event happens. The other um, big sign that it happens before the temple's destruction, remember this is something that would have been, uh, you know, it would have sent shockwaves through the Jewish world um, when, it, when it happened. It was such a landmark event for them. Um, the other thing that is, is sort of telling as to its timing is that the author persistently uses the present tense whenever he talks about the sacrificial, sacrificial system or the priest offering sacrifices in the temple. It's always, they are, it is currently happening. Uh, it's never in the past tense, it's always in the present tense. So that, uh, that places the text and its authorship around 30, 35 years after Jesus, if we're working from a zero timeline. And as we've hinted at, the, um, the intended audience of the text is a, is a Jewish audience, um, one that is, uh, as we'll see as we jump into chapters one and two tonight, one that is uh, familiar with the Old Testament. There's a lot of quoting of the Hebrew Bible in Hebrews. There's a detailed knowledge and reference to the Jewish sacrificial system, something that the author is just assuming that people know as a default. There's no effort to explain it or, or to justify its significance. It's something that, that people would have uh, at ready on hand as knowledge. Um, but we're probably looking at Hellenized Jews, meaning Jews who lived in the broader Greek speaking world, but were not centered in, uh, centered in, in, in Jerusalem. Um, there are many references, we'll see one or two in chapter two, to encouraging perseverance in the text. Uh, we'll get that later on in chapter 12. Um, it pops up all throughout the letter. The, the author is continually exhorting um, his audience to continue on in the faith, to remind themselves of why it is so important for them to keep the profession of their faith, even in the face of persecution. So we're talking to a dispersed, persecuted Jewish Christian audience outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem. And the possibility is that they are thinking about returning to Judaism. There's the, post uh, the, there's the possibility of apostasy, say that five times fast, right? Um, he keeps encouraging people to hold on, to not leave. And you wonder why, why would Jewish Christians who had already made such a sacrifice uh, think about returning to Judaism? First and foremost, uh, there's a cultural heritage or memory there. It's familiar, familiar enough to them. But another more important reason is that Judaism uh, was a legally recognized and protected religion under the Roman Empire, something that was not afforded to Christians, to early Christians. And so it could have felt to Jewish Christians in really hot water like a really tempting opportunity to just sidestep a whole lot of pain and death if they went from being Christian, which is a newly realized sect of Judaism, only recently broken away, and into Judaism with all of the legal protections that come with it. Uh, and so 
here the author is is really not only trying to remind them to hold the faith, but he's using uh, Jewish imagery and language and the language of the Hebrew Bible in order to make uh, their case. The author is using very familiar concepts to make the case. And that leads me into, um, into a note as we continue into this text on supersessionism. Um, by a quick show of hands, if I say the word supersessionism in the term in relationship to the Bible, does anyone have any context about what I'm talking about? Okay. Uh, Bruce, I'm not surprised. <laughs> supersessionism is this idea that the church so we remember in the, in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament that the people of Israel had a special covenant with God. They were God's people and God made promises to them. And we see those promises fulfilled um, throughout the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible and in the person of Jesus as the Messiah. There is a strain of thought that comes along that essentially says, we're no longer Jewish. We're no longer bound by Jewish sacrificial system or purity laws or dietary restrictions. In fact, the church is the new Israel. We've inherited everything that Israel was ever promised and we are God's special people and Israel is not on God's map anymore. Uh, yeah, Ralph. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, now in 65 AD, was there a real distinction between Christians and Jews? Was it not perfectly possible to be a, a Jew and a follower of Jesus? I guess the concept of, my understanding was the concept of a Christian as distinct from a Jew hadn't really emerged yet. So was there, I wonder if this sense of apostasy was, was necessary or whether just unproblematically they could be Jewish and be followers of Jesus, thanks. That's a good question. So actually, um, no, it wasn't, uh, there was enough time and enough of a split. Remember, Matthew writes gospel about 70 and it's really geared at, um, there, it's geared to a Jewish audience, but it's also coming from a point of conflict between Jewish uh, Christians, oh, sorry, excuse me, Christians and then Jews as we traditionally understand it in the area and the and the oppression and sort of friction that was happening between the two. And Jews, uh, Jewish communities at the time uh, with enough distance, so especially the time period we're talking about, were more than happy uh, to sort of point out Christians and denounce them as uh, people who were not Jewish, who had left the fold, who were something other. So there was enough of a divorce at this time and enough of conflict between the two the two parties um, with Jewish communities making it very clear that they did not view Christians as members of, of their religious community. And that then put Christians into hot water, right? Because if, if they'd been allowed to coexist sort of within the, within the larger umbrella, they might've been able to kind of skate by like you're talking about, but that wasn't, that wasn't how it shook out. Question? Uh, Question? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, I'm struck in this annotated uh, footnoted Bible, I'm, the new revised standard version, by how much, how many of the uh, letters, Paul's and this one, quote from the, the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures. Are there more of those in support of your, uh, th this idea that you're, you're explaining to us in Hebrews than elsewhere? Um, well, remember, uh, during the time of the writing of the New Testament, the Hebrew Bible was all they had. That's all that, that that's all that gets quoted. Um, there's one, there's one bit in which Paul sort of refers to Peter's writings, uh, as authoritative, as scripture, but, uh, there, both communities are working from the same text, uh, right? They're, they're working with Jew, you know, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians are both dealing with Jewish scriptures, um, except that uh, Christians are interpreting them in a, in a totally different light. And it's, in fact, that proximity that is what causes the friction between the two communities, right? If you think about it, like, to, to Christians, other Christians who disagree with you a little bit are much more of an annoyance than are people of a totally different faith, right? I don't care about the conflict going on in Theravada Buddhism because it doesn't affect me. 
but you have someone who is perhaps adjacent to my own tradition, but saying, you're doing that wrong, we should do it this way, that causes much more conflict. And so that is, that's one of the, that's one of the seeds of, of the, the eventual division that comes from this text. So, um, so supersessionism is this idea that grows out that essentially says the church completely places, replaces Israel. Um, when in fact, Paul gives a totally different image. I think it's in Romans, is it 12? I'm just pulling this out of my hat right now. Um, in which uh, Paul talks about the church being grafted onto the tree that was Israel, the olive tree, right? Acknowledging uh, the Jewish tradition as the, the root uh, that gives Christianity life and out of which Christianity grows. And he, he even says there explicitly, is Israel forsaken? God forbid. There's, there's not this sense of the abandonment of Israel. Um, and it's an awfully long quote, but it's, uh, it's important to, I think, to help frame our minds as we read this text, because there's going to be a lot of friction between um, Jewish concepts, Jewish religious concepts and Christian concepts and the author is, is already, as we can see, starting to take Jewish concepts and dragging them into Christianity and reapplying them to Jesus. And so understanding this in the, in the proper voice, I think is helpful. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Oh my gosh, it's 7.25 and we haven't even started the text. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real, real quick. And it's this quote right here, starting with two really so um, the Aging Christian Commentary on Hebrews in, in their preface had a, had a really good uh, paragraph. And so that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, two related issues in particular will be addressed uh, briefly. The rhetorical use of comparison called synchrisis and invective called sogos. As is well known, the epistle to the Hebrews describes the new that came in Christ by means of comparing it with wider Judaism, defined particularly in terms of Old Testament exegetical traditions associated with the tabernacle. Remember that tent that prefigured the temple that the people of Israel coming out of Egypt carried around as their site of worship. In antiquity, however, the rhetorical device of comparison, syncresis, was understood to begin with what was construed as noble and good. The goal was not to disparage the basis of comparison, but assuming its goodness to move the audience to accept the superiority of that which was being proposed as an alternative. Such syncresis functioned um, in order to give honor to its subject. And so when the, the commentators here at least uh, are, are suggesting that when you read comparisons to the sacrificial system in the temple and Jesus in the book of Hebrews, you're really seeing an honoring of that tradition and the author trying to push them into a new spiritual truth, a further development of the truth that they have already known, rather than slamming one side and elevating their own. That's at least the argument that the author of these commentators are giving. Um, it'll be up to us to see how well that sits as we continue to read through the text together. All right, so with that all being said, um, let's jump into Hebrews chapter one. Does, um, does everybody have a Bible with them or do you have the Google Doc up? Because in the Google Doc, I, I put the entire text plus um, some notes as comments. Uh, could I have someone read the first four verses of chapter one? Uh, yeah, just go for it. Me? Uh, yes, Bruce. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has obtained is more excellent than theirs. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bruce. All right. 
someone kick us off. What strikes you in this text? What stands out? Yeah, Julia. Um, even though my translation is slightly different than Bruce's, the same thing struck me when he read as when I read this earlier today. And that's the line that um, at the end of these days, he spoke to us in his son, that, 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 through whom he made the ages, which I think the other translation says the world. I don't know that I ever thought of God making the world through the sun. Mm. Yeah, good, good. You picked on something really, really big there. Um, so right there at that text, uh, yeah, the end of verse two, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Uh, there, if you if you flip, um, actually, this is why having a, a physical Bible in front of you actually might be advisable. And I, the only one I have in front of me right now is my King James. It's my guilty secret. Don't tell anyone. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, uh, starting in verse 15. Uh, and Colossians is written around the same exact time that Hebrews is being written. People put it at about 62. Remember, Hebrews is 63, 64. So we're seeing the emergence of a new understanding of Jesus. Uh, the author there says, again, this is the KJV, sorry about that, who is the image, speaking of Christ, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Does it strike anyone else as, um, as striking that to, to think of, of Jesus as involved in creation? Or if it doesn't, can you point to something somewhere else in the Bible uh, where you might see that at work? Yeah, Ralph. Yeah, well, this does strike me. I mean, this is like uh, the the Gospel of John, yes, and rather different from Mark, Matthew, and Luke. That this really that this really brings up the idea that uh, Jesus is co-eternal with God. I think it's in the Nicene Creed. Is Jesus through whom all things were created? Um, but it's it strike as I recall, there are some things later in that which seem to be a, a different approach, seem to be that God begot his son who, who then became Jesus Christ, that there's, there are other things which imply something other than the co-eternality of Jesus with God. Thanks. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, Melissa, go ahead. The the Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Uh, oh, yeah, to, to Ralph's um, uh, second point about God begetting the Son, uh, the Orthodox explain it as God, as the, the begetting of the Son, the second person of the Trinity, happens outside of time. The begettedness, begottenness of Jesus is uh, a sign of relationship, not action. Um, so the relationship is a, as of a father to a son in the passing on of nature. Uh, not an action happening located in time. Okay. That, I know that's not a very tangible concept to, to grab. <laughs> but, um, but in fact, to your point in referencing the Nicene Creed and in, in going back to Julia's question, so um, what we see is a, a Christology um, that uh, becomes the foundation for Nicene Christianity. So the authors of the Nicene Creed actually in, in the early 400s, 320, uh, fourth century, 325, uh, they went back to this text in Hebrews and they used it as a foundational stone in their building out of a full Christology. And as they were trying to thread the needle of Jesus was a human, so how can he be God? But if he was God, how could he have, you know, had pain or died? And and how are they related? Um, so actually, when, when fleshing out the expression of Christianity that has become the Nicene Creed, they went back to Hebrews 1 in this text. And, and uh, rightfully, Ralph, you brought up John 1, right? What is, what is the word that is used, I've already told it to you, uh, that John uses to describe who the person of Jesus is? In the beginning was the word, right? This word logos, 
Um, so John is taking a fundamental concept from the Hellenic word, uh, world, excuse me, of, of ration and order and principle and framing Christ, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity as the agent of creation. So God speaks and it is the word that God speaks is the logos, is Christ, through which and in which and for which all of creation exists. Uh, yeah, Anne. Um, in verse three, <clears throat> it mentions when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Part of that is so much of the Nicene Creed. Um, purification of sins, is that crucifixion or his descent into hell? Um, depends on who you talk to. Actually, let's, let's, let's kick it around. I feel like I'm talking a lot <laughs> here and this is supposed to be dialogue. Um, when we read purification, purification of sins, what do we, what do we think? Do you automatically just go to the crucifixion? Ralph, looks like you do. Uh, yes. Will you will you tell me your name next to Anne? Rufus. I'm sorry. Rufus. Thank and you, sir. We're, we're on her laptop. Yeah. <laughs> no, I. We were talking about this earlier, and I said, well, I think we all are taught to believe that the Christ's death was an expiation for the sins of mankind. Hmm. Certainly, his his death is a is a component of that. Right. Um, and, I, and I I'll say more in a second. I just want to see if anyone else has any other thoughts on this. Yeah, Julia. Well, so I did go immediately to the crucifixion, but then when I just heard Anne speak, I realized there is the other possibility that it means the descent into hell and and you know what he, what he did in in that time while while mm -hmm. he was there. So I don't know. I think one of the beauties of this is that it leaves open both both and maybe more possibilities. That's true. Um, so to break our, our sort of linear progression through the text right now, since we've all, most of us have read chapters one and two, what is the thing in chapter two that the author is perpetually hitting home about Jesus? Chapter one is all about angels. Chapter two is all about what? Seems to kind of be about humility and like the the kind of nature of the relationship between Jesus and us or, and like the people that he dwelt with on earth. Mm, mm. Oh, great. Thank you, Duncan. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's his relationship to us, but it's his relationship to us in a very particular way. Right. How did, how did Jesus, uh, what's the theological word uh, we use to talk about how Jesus came to be among us? Incarnation. Incarnation. Incarnation right? So I would actually suggest for you that uh, the purification of sins was, began on Christmas, right? Not that Jesus just raised his body up to the age of 33 so it could get killed, but that in some way the entire incarnation was Jesus taking on the human experience and then performing the priestly function of offering it back to God to be sanctified. And this concept comes, uh, does that, sorry, I, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What I just said? Yeah. So Jesus is I, literally inhabiting and, you, and offering back his, the entirety of his life and not just the crucifixion. Yeah, Bruce. I just want to say, yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense. I can certainly see why the Eastern Church would love this epistle to the Hebrews. Your example of the nativity in the Eastern Church the Magi, of course, are already there. So you have this panoply of who's there at the nativity, but where is Mary and Jesus? What's behind them? It is the cave. It is the analogy of why is he here mm. that eventually there will be the anastasis and that he will have this descent into Hades and the, the resurrection and the anesthesis, it's, it's, it's very closely connected in the iconography of the Eastern Church. The whole from the very, from, there, right? Explain the word anesthetist. 
It's the, it's the Greek word for resurrection, for the resurrection, a standing up again, it literally means. Um, yes, exactly. So, um, so, so in this, it's, it's really important because the, the whole theme of chapter two is the solidarity, the profound, um, the profound solidarity that Jesus uh, exhibits through becoming like his brothers and sisters is the language that the author uses in chapter two. Um, but it's, it's this idea, sorry, let me see if I can find it. I think it's, 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 it's chapter two, verse 14. Children share flesh and blood. Yes. He himself likewise shared the same things. So the, um, and, and, the, and, and then the author goes on to, to say how it's that in the entirety of the experience in 17, chapter 2, 17, therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he might be a faithful and high priest. It was the entirety of the incarnation which allowed Jesus to redeem humanity. And there becomes a, there are echoes of Paul's treatise on um, 1 Corinthians 15 on the resurrection in there about how Jesus begins to represent an entire new humanity, a second Adam, not simply, uh, not simply the one single penitential sacrifice that wipes our slates. There's a, there's a difference there. There's a, the, the second one has sort of a penal focus, whereas the, the first is more about the redemption of the, of the entirety of humanity. There's a more, more global scope to it. Um, I forgot the original question that we were on, actually. Oh, you were asking about um, making a uh, propitiation for sins, atonements for sins, right? I think that that was the original question that uh, Anne had. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, rabbit trail. Uh, any, anything else to say? Uh, yeah, Donald. Um, before we get too far along, I mean, before we leave the topic and, and move on, I'd like to go back to what I think I heard earlier. Are, is, is the idea in this and Colossians is that God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, was always there, always at the right hand of God. Yes. All right. Yeah. Even before he was incarnated as a human. Yes. Okay. Just yeah. wanted to be clear about that. Yes. So Jesus did not begin. Right. It's not like it's not like uh, it was God and the Holy Spirit, and then Jesus kind of got added on after after his birth. Jesus right. is is the human incarnation uh so the the simultaneously human and simultaneously divine incarnation of the pre-existent second member of the trinity that we call the son right the son so, not because jesus is the son of god but because that second member of the trinity is begotten outside of time like we were talking about earlier with ralph there's that relationality with the father so we're already starting to like push into heavy Trinitarian dynamics. Yeah. So, yeah, so we run into the problem of maybe the idea of father and son is somehow not as literal as one might take it. It's more an, an, a symbol, um, an offshoot. Um, it is, uh, it is, first and foremost, it's, it's how our tradition understands Jesus to describe his relationship with God, which is why we give it so much prominence and and room even though it's clumsy um what it, who's it gregory of netzianza says uh when he's writing about the trinity that it's really the you could equally say the unbegotten being god the father the begotten god the son and the um what is it the the procession god the procession the holy spirit uh that takes out kind of the familial dynamic dynamics that yeah obviously to have a son with a father you need a you know you need a mother and all of that but um, are there any other notes in here that I wanted to flag for you? Oh, I asked sorry. a question. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Is what you're saying with, um, incarnation and, uh, begotten, um, so does that mean, does it mean that the, the virgin birth was was actually not the beginning of 
Jesus's quote life unquote so to speak but the beginning of his incarnation i mean that... jesus of nazareth did not exist in the same way before before the nativity but jesus of nazareth was the incarnation of the eternal son of god who we call the christ or the logos does that make sense uh it sense. it's a crazy mystery i, re I realize that well the, the incarnation means when he was uh made into like a human form took on flesh yeah took on a human form okay flesh so would that that would mean when he was born on earth no uh, yes, yeah, that, that does refer to the nativity, um, just stressing there that uh, while Jesus' physical body began at Christmas, it, it, was, it was the body of the incarnated, uh, incarnate, right, in meat, in flesh, in fleshed word right. of God, son of God. I see, okay. Not the beginning of his existence, so to speak. No. No. Yeah, Suzanne. Um, so this seems to me to be like a rather high Christology and in line with John. Is what you're saying, <clears throat> because I know that John is the highest kind of Christology in terms of the Gospels, would, would this theory jive at all with any of the other Gospels in lower Christology? Um, it doesn't in any way conflict with the image of Christ, which is presented in the Gospels. But, um, you know, the Christology that you get in Mark is very rudimentary, right? Mm -hmm. You get the, essentially the bare bones of, of the point. You get a lot about what Jesus did, and a lot of Jesus' divinity is manifested through his actions and his words. Whereas, as you say, John meditates on what it means to be God and man in the same body. Um, so it wouldn't directly conflict, but we, we do see a progression, a progression uh -huh. of words, um, a, a fleshing out of the idea uh, that starts to accrue more detail and time as the church develops. Because I, I know that there's, you know, some ideas that, um, that a lower Christology where um, Jesus was born and then God decides to make him Christ. Adoptionism. This seems to be like a, a different, um, a way different approach. Yes, um, and people people can use uh, certain parts of uh, the gospel, like like in Mark, uh, I think is is prone to that. In this idea that sometimes you seem to understand this idea of like Jesus being a, a, like elevated into the role of the Son of God, but that was never um, actually explicitly. A belief of the early church and adoptionism uh -huh. out pretty pretty quickly. Oh, okay, all right. Out of the mainstream, but then again, I mean, um, you know, we're talking about how important this text is for uh, for the writing of the Nicene Creed. Um, uh -huh. You realize uh, Arianism, uh, not like white supremacy Arianism. Arianism, <laughs> God, <laughs> just the highest creation of God and not God, God's self. Arianism was the dominant Christology and form of Christianity before the Council of Nicaea. And it was putting the entire empire in conflict, which is why the, the emperor even forced the council in the beginning. Explain um, Arianism again. Arianism is this idea uh, in which Jesus is the highest creation of God possible, above angels, above everything else, but not God. Uh-huh. And so Arius said- so, and That seems to be what this is, the beginning of this that I read is, is saying, they're going over this in Hebrews, right? Um, so Hebrews would be, uh, would be uh, if you look at chap uh, verse three in chapter one again, Hebrews is saying that Jesus is not a creation of God, that Jesus is the reflection of God's glory, ah, the okay. imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful, world, powerful word, excuse me, the fact that Jesus's word has agency, the only other person in scripture that has a word with agency is God, right? There's this okay. 
it's almost like in the creed when we go God from God, light from light, true God from true God. The uh -huh. author here is doing the same thing and sort of layering on these things that are only, you know, the exact imprint of his being, sustaining all things through his word. Thank you. Yeah, Ralph. Oh, just to, to continue to dive into this a little more, it does seem that the text is a little contradictory. It does say, yeah, through whom he also created the world, which is the high Christology of the uh, Nicene Creed. But then he says, when he had made purification for his sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, which suggests that maybe he wasn't sitting there beforehand. And then having become as much superior to the angels. So that after the incarnation and the sacrifice and the crucifixion, then he became higher than the angels, which is a little bit of a contradiction with the idea that he was co-eternal and was on high from the very be from from the very beginning. Thanks. Yes, very very good sharp reading uh, there there Ralph, and I I appreciate that. Um, what is what is actually happening in in that? So. Uh, what is it? Is it? It's somewhere in John three. Jesus, um, Jesus essentially equates his crucifixion, his being lifted up, as a unique expression of God's glory, right? That that he might be glorified and draw all all people to himself. There is a there's a distinct um, theological sort of thread in the New Testament that the crucifixion, the passion and resurrection, is in fact the culmination of the display of God's glory in the person of Christ and in his ministry. And so there is a unique glorification of Christ and his work uh, that happens because of the passion and the resurrection and ascension. And that's what, generally that's what, uh, I, I'm, the commentary that I quoted earlier and, and I'll use for the rest of this series, it's essentially a bunch of quotes by early, like, you know, church fathers from the first few centuries, and, and they sort of dance around this, and they're like, it's not that he's getting a promotion, it's it's more in line with the crucifixion being an elevation of, glorific of glory, right? It's not that it's uh, like the biggest failure that God's ever had, but in fact, God's greatest glory, and, and referring it to it that way. I mean, yeah, no, I'm sorry. No, you're good. No, go ahead. Oh, what I mean, about? Oh, okay. Go yeah. ahead, Melissa. Sorry. Um, or, or referring to Jesus as the high priest. Yeah. So, um, so we 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 will get into that. I should have not tried to do because that. that he started the, the the royal priesthood. The the he's the high priest, and then the birth of the royal priesthood and 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 the priesthood. So remember, um, remember that big quote I gave you at the beginning that talked about um, comparison, syncresis, right? Uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, the author to Hebrews here is relying heavily, and he'll do this throughout the text. They will do this throughout the text, excuse me, I don't mean to automatically say he, um, where they compare the Levitical priesthood, right? The one that started with Aaron, the brother of Moses, and the sacrificial system with the priesthood of Melchizedek. Uh, Mel Melchizedek is this extremely obscure, we'll meet him later in Hebrews. Um, he's this extremely obscure figure from, uh, from Genesis. And he meets Abraham and he's uh, the king of a city and he comes out offering or bearing bread and wine. And many people see uh, this king of Mel Melchizedek as uh, a theophany, a prefiguration of Christ, a sort of Old Testament apparition of, of the second person of the Trinity uh, as a fore, foreteller of Jesus. Um, and so the author of Hebrews then is comparing Jesus's line of priesthood with the Levitical mosaic line of priesthood. There's, a, there's sort of a competition of brands happening there. Um, Duncan, and then we'll do Benjamin. Yeah, I, I was I was just gonna say kind of on that on that conversation we were having about uh, what was it um, the kind of temporal elements of Jesus sitting down uh, on the at the right hand of the Majesty. I mean, I think in some ways, like, does it matter too much 
like it's the author begging us to ask this question or is the author trying to like say this is where we're, we're like starting our conversation i think that's probably like at least from the first two chapters it seems like the primary concern here is more about like the, the kind of immediate or like the contemporary questions about jesus and and those things that have come up rather than like i mean there's almost like an assumed understanding of of like you know this kind of theology uh mm. by by the audience i think he's about or they are about to say like you know we're here to talk about like the jesus that came down to earth and what we're going to do now as a response to that um mm. and like this is where jesus is at the moment um you know as opposed to like whatever 40 years ago when he was on earth that that's a that's a great point and thank you um yeah you um let me just collect my thoughts here for a second i think it's actually pretty telling that um i i think for a wide majority of christians that this sort of christology feels uh maybe as foreign as it does and i think maybe that's an indictment on on how we preach and teach jesus especially here uh in america um, because as you, as we talked about earlier with Colossians, you have this consensus understanding of Jesus starting to develop. Of course, there was, there was confusion and disagreement in the early church about who Jesus was. And that's why we get heterodox views. Um, but you have this consensus mainstream really arising in which is expanding the concept of Jesus outside of the person who walked around in Nazareth. Uh, and I, and I think it's, it's telling that it's actually a surprise, surprise to most modern, modern Christians. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dorothy. Um, in terms of the reason for this letter, the very basic reason, yes, the Christians were being persecuted politically. It was dangerous what they were doing and, and believing, but didn't many of them in the early days think the end times were coming and that hadn't happened immediately? Obviously it hasn't yet. And they were discouraged and thought, well, maybe this just isn't true. Maybe we'll just walk away. It's dangerous. And maybe it isn't even true. Um, that's a great, uh, great point. I'm actually, uh, uh, let's see, I'm looking at First Thessalonians because, oh yeah. So we're, we're, we're past the, the reason I looked up the writing of the date of the epistle to the first, to the first epistle to the Thessalonians is that Paul is addressing, um, sort of return of Jesus fatigue among early Christians. But Paul's writing that in like 50. So that, that's a good decade uh, before where we're at. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure between the persecutions and uh, rejection by family and the fact that Jesus did not in fact come back as a glorious king, um, right? The mainstream perspective on who the Messiah would be among the people of Israel was that it's going to be a warrior king who was going to kick out the Romans and reinstate, you know, perfect temple worship. And sure, you could have these Jewish Christians, you know, having, you know, their family members or something saying like, your guy's not coming back and you guys are getting killed. So maybe you're, uh, you're on, you know, you bet you back the wrong horse. Um, mm -hmm. That's a, that's an astute insight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, it's um it's seven fifty eight, and we barely got through the beginning of chapter one. Um, do you, do you, do you all have like fifteen more minutes in you to touch on angels and jump through that really quickly? If you need to go, go, and that's totally fine. None of this is is obviously mandatory. Um, why don't you plod on? Why don't you go on through what you wanted to let us know, and then we can open the floor for questions again. So um, a lot of what I was going to share is actually in uh, in that Google Doc that I sent. And so what I'm actually going to try and do is get to where I'm a week ahead in producing these, and I'll send them to you in advance. Um, and if you also then want to add your own notes, or um, you know, or you kind of come armed with knowing what I was going to say anyway, so we have more time for discussion, I think we'll, if people are open to that, we'll we'll shoot for that. Um, so we go down into verses five through. Uh, 14 to round out the chapter. And if, if you're on the Google Doc, you'll see I've decided to list every single scriptural citation that the author is uh, dropping here because uh, they're going at it hard. So um, 
it begins for to which of the angels did God ever say you are my son and today I have begotten you uh, and that's that's Psalm 2 or again I will be his father and he will be my son that's coming from God's covenant with King David from 2 Samuel uh, or in chat in verse 6 let all God's angels worship him that's Deuteronomy 32 uh, verse 7, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire, Psalm 104. Verse 8, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. There's a direct claim of divinity that's relating the Son to O God. Um, and that's Psalm 45. That's a royal psalm. In verse 9, you've got, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. You've got Isaiah 66 in verse 11 uh, or verse 10. In the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Uh, going back to that pre-existence of Christ here, right? Because we're already talking about the son and the author here is laying out all of these Old Testament references that he's tacking on as characteristics of who the son is. And we've already established that the son is Jesus. And now we're learning all of the things that make the divine Jesus uh, unique. And so we've already got that the universe is going to perish, but you will remain. There's a, there's a call for, or there's, a, there's a statement of eternity on the part of Jesus there. Um, that's Psalm 102, as I said. And then like a cloak, you will roll them up. And like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will never end. Hebrews is the same text that we get Jesus Christ uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow forever the same. And then in verse 13, uh, but to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool at your feet? Psalm 110 again. And then the author ends the chapter by saying, are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? That's both him, uh, excuse me, the author establishing um, establishing Jesus as above the angels, as it is leading into next, into the second chapter about, uh, about the importance of humanity and its salvation and why Jesus became a human. But I wanted to get through the angel bit, uh, really quickly because I wanted to come back to answering Ellen's question that I promised her we would get to, um, yeah, so, uh, so you know, we, we've got, you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes. What stands out to you uh, here in the text about what the author is saying about angels? How does that conflict with your own understanding of angels? Um, yeah, what, do, what are we bringing to this whole segment on why? And why do we think the author is really important, uh, intentional about showing Jesus above angels? Angels feel pretty secondary in the Bible. Weren't angels just messengers? They did not originate anything. That was always clear. Everything we read about angels, they just tell someone something that they need to hear. That's what angels do. Right, but, right. But Jesus is the ultimate messenger. So there's the superior, exactly. There's a, there's a, there is the, the idea, like we were talking about, that was good, this is better, right? Yeah. Going from something which was sufficient to something which is the fullness of the expression. Yeah. Also, what didn't this, wasn't this somewhat useful in, count, in uh, counteracting uh, Arianism? Um, it, that definitely, this was, this was useful, though it was, a little, it was a little murky there for a period because around um, the late, second century, first century, second century, uh, I don't have the dates right in my head, but um, an angelic Christology started to develop. This idea that Jesus was sort of uh, a super powerful archangel. Now this was something that was never mainstream. Church fathers were not teaching this, but eventually we see you know, statements such as these. You've got other statements in, in other gospels which make Jesus out to be very human. So we have a patchwork of, of perspectives and that causes different, you know, viewpoints to sort of bubble up, which is why we get to Nicaea a few hundred years later that really tries to set the, set the okay, great. So um, yeah, Bruce. Just a couple of comments. Um, uh, 
one, there's no, I don't have the linguistic skills to illustrate what I'm going to say, but in reading some of the commentaries about this, I was so struck by the emphasis on what beautiful Greek Hebrews is written in. And I think we can see some of that here. I, as again, I'll say, I can certainly see why the Eastern church baptized the letter to the Hebrews very early and used it a great deal. And of course, their liturgy is full of analogies going back to, uh, to Adam or to all of these quotations from the Psalms that you illustrated at appropriate times. Um, and it's not to put down the angels, the angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, and thrones in a sense of, I mean, in the Eastern church, the liturgy carries uh, liturgical fans to show the presence of angels with us while we are worshiping. But um, it reminds me once again, of that wonderful icon of, in the sixth century of St. Romanus, Romanus the Melodist on his Akathis to Mary, in which it's not that the angel is being put down or whatever, but when he goes to greet the Virgin, it's not that he, in this one Akathis, he's not telling her that she will be the mother of Christ. He is shocked. His greeting is just simply that, a wonderful honorific greeting, because he sees the logos already formed in her womb. And so the Akathis then proclaims that out of empathy, out of sympathy with suffering humanity, correcting all the things that happened after Adam, um, uh, God has kept the beauty of the incarnate logos even from the highest ranks of angels. After all, it was Gabriel that does the, the greeting or the proclamation, if you please. So uh, here we have all of these angels considered in all of their various activities, prayers, proclamations, greetings, yes, sometimes messengers, sometimes presences. Um, but it emphasizes, again, I think, the relational character of the incarnation with humanity, this, this distinction. Absolutely. Thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. the, the key thing in, um, in all of the activities of the angels that you listed uh, is that um, the key characteristic of an angelic being, as we understand it in the Bible, um, and I really don't know what to do with angels. I'm not an authority on them. Um, I don't really know how to conceive of them, except for like up in heaven. I don't think of like guardian angels or that kind of thing. Um, is that angels are uh, perfectly aligned with the will of God, right? An angel does what the Lord commands. An angel exists as an extension uh, to fulfill God's will or to carry out God's message. There is a perfect alignment there. An angel never wavers and doubts about, you know, do I want to do this, you know, delivery run on, on a certain message to a certain person. The author of Hebrews is making this point about the superiority of Christ because he's, uh, they are uh, on this, uh, uh, on this mission in order to sort of stack all of the layers of spiritual authority and to place Christ above that. Christ is not, the one perfectly aligned with the will of the father, though, of course, in his incarnation, he was Christ is the will of the father. There's a, there's a quote that I was going to share um, that was more prevalent for, for chapter two, but it, um, oh, where, where did that go? But it, it essentially was the assertion that uh, here, uh, no, 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 no. I lost that comment. Anyway, it's that uh, the fullness of God's image that we see in Christ is actually the fullness of the plan of salvation. 
And so the author is making this point that if angels are ones who are um, in perfect fidelity to God's will, you don't have Christ next to them as the perfect, most perfect person fulfilling God's will. You have Christ as the will of God. There's, a, there's an exercise in embodiment happening there. And then the other point real quick, and then we'll jump to Julia and Anne. The other point I wanna make is I, I noted all those scripture citations because so many of them relate to David. So once again, we've got, we've got the mention of prophets at the very beginning of the chapter. We've got angels, and now we have King David. That King David, Jesus comes from King David's son, so the author is trying to establish Jesus's Jewish credentials, right? The people of Israel expected the Messiah to come from David's line. But then you also have the superior, superiority of Christ over David, right? Christ is elevated to the level of son and not simply a friend of God as, as David was. And so sort of on all the measures of authority that the Jewish mind could think of when it came to spirituality or their faith, the author of Hebrews here is saying, angels, no. Prophets, no. David, no. Christ, above all of it, encapsulating. Yeah, Julia. So um, putting myself in the first century, you mentioned at the beginning that this audience knew the Hebrew Bible inside out. I mean, that was their frame of reference. So is all this stuff about angels and Jesus being greater and prophets and Jesus being greater, that's kind of to not undo what they know, but to relate to what they know and say that this is different because. Yes, precisely. That's that's precisely the point that that uh, cumbersome paragraph about comparison syncresis that I gave you was all about, right? To use something which was really f familiar load stars of religious authority and use those then to demonstrate even further the superiority of Jesus. Uh, yeah, Anne. Um, just a question. Um, am I not right that the devil is considered a fallen angel? Um, you are, and I think Peter uses that specific language about Satan or Lucifer, but um, the f it, you have to do some clever textual footwork to get the kind of archetypal Lucifer star <laughs> raised in heaven and then fell and it takes a lot of stitch work, in my opinion, to sort of get it's more Milton than Bible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the bones were there from what Milton was doing, but you know, sort of like when you see a movie and it says like based on true events. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen. Yeah. Um, my question about the angels is, do we know how they got there? Um, were they created or were they always there too? Are they part of, are they part of the Godhead? No, no. angels are part of the Godhead. Angels are creations. Um, so they were, the God made the angels? Yes. Uh, remember that text in first in, uh, Colossians that I read? Um, and it talks about how everything is created through Jesus, including thrones and principalities. Okay. okay. That's New Testament language for talking about spiritual hierarchies in the same way that Paul says powers and principalities when he refers to the devil as the prince of the air right, sort of okay. spiritual authorities, um, things we might call demons or angels. Um, and then in terms of creation, uh, where is it in the New Testament that someone says that the angels sang at creation? It's somewhere, somewhere there. So there's like a brief scriptural nugget that says that the angels were present before creation. Oh. Well, but, they say it in the Timothy, if you want to count that as creation. <laughs> the creation of a new humanity, yeah. yeah. Very good. But um, yeah, I mean, angels are, are powerful spiritual okay. forces, but that's about all we... Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, it's 8.13. Uh, I don't want to keep you all from, from your dinners or what else uh, you have planned. Um, thank you so much for this. I think next yeah. week... Uh, we are going to have to double up on some weeks because we only have eight sessions together due to the calendar. But I think next week, let's try and do chapter two. If we fly through that, we'll just jump into cap chapter three cold uh, for <laughs> bits and giggles, pardon my language. Um, 
otherwise, uh, yeah, we'll do chapter two and um, feel free to refer to the Google Doc before, uh, before next week's session. Um, does anybody, I'm springing this on you, but does anybody want to pray us out? First of all, I want to thank you very much. Oh yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anne and Rufus. Thank you so much for joining us. And Ben, uh, 